All right, so we cruising on in Genesis uh, 7 and, Lord willing, chapter 8 tonight. I want to read a couple sections of Scripture before we get there. Uh, one will be 2 Peter chapter 1. And, uh, you know, we kind of look at it, and of all the things you could save, Lord, and all the things that you really throw in your word, you know, you got the flood, Noah, and, and the Lord really devotes a, a real chunk of his word to us on both Noah and the flood. And so, why is, why is that important? Why do we have these things that almost seem, how is that even possible that he would keep for us? And so as we kind of get into that tonight, I want to look at a few verses first. One is 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16 through 21. And Peter here says, For we did not follow cunningly devised fables, When we made known to you the power and the coming of the Lord Jesus. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came from him or to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice that came from heaven. We were with him on the holy mountain. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. God has given us His word and he confirms it. The, the existence of the flood in, and what it means kind of radiates throughout Scripture. And it should bring us hope and comfort. The other section of Scripture I want to look at before we get started is John chapter 14. Verses 1 through 6. John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6. Jesus is going to be speaking here. And he says, Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And here's key. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may also be. So before Peter says, hey, we have the prophetic word confirmed, so we know about his power and his coming. Jesus says, if I go, I will come again. And verse 4, and where I go, you know, and the way you know. And then Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going and how, you, how we know the way. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. The Word of God either stands in its entirety or it does not stand at all. Because if one promise of God, whether it be a flood and judgment, does not stand, none of it stands. Jesus said, if I go, I will come. Peter talked about having the prophetic word confirmed. Romans chapter 15, verse 4 says, For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we, through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. So basically, all this time, all of this Scripture to say that God builds a record for us, both in our own lives personally as as you'll see what he has to say come true in your life, you begin to trust him more and more. As you see the the truth in the scriptures and as you walk with him, so grows your faith because he's not a one-hit wonder. He continues to prove and to display both who he is and what he can do. 
So as we look at one of these real benchmarks tonight, the flood, um, I hope that the reality of the flood and who God is will encourage your faith all the way down to the most simple promises in your life. Genesis chapter 7, verse 1. Then the Lord said to Noah, Come into the ark and all your household, because I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. So here's the first time we really see this word come arrive in the scriptures. And the Lord from inside the ark, it would seem, says, Come into the ark, Noah. Come into the salvation. God, for almost a century now, had been uh, proclaiming and letting the people know that his judgment was coming. And in here, he calls Noah and his family to come on in. The ark winds up being a beautiful picture of the Lord and his salvation as the judgment would come. And they would enter into the only way in as the Lord called them. Something also interesting to note about Noah is that he stood out in his generation as a preacher of righteousness, as one who um, was a light in a dark place. Noah stood out in his community, in his generation. Probably mostly because he was building a big gigantic boat that nobody had ever seen before like that. So that could have made him stand out, but the Lord points him out as, as not just for building a big boat in his backyard, and everybody calling him crazy. Verse 2, You shall take with you seven of each of every clean animal, a male and his female, two of each animals that are unclean, a male and his female. Also, seven of each of birds of the air, male and female, to keep the species alive on the face of the earth. So we're going to be dealing with a a lot of animals. And the difficulty, again, you run in because this story has been told so many times in Sunday school or rattled off as something not possible. Um, oftentimes, we'll, we'll skip right over its reality. Um, I'm going to go off on a bit of a different tangent tonight, so I'm not going to really go off on, on how it's possible to get the animals in the ark, though many people have demonstrated that it was perfectly possible. Um, so the Lord calls them, and it seems that, as I used to love to point out to my Sunday school kids, that it wasn't just two of each kind of animal. There was actually much more. They went in two by two. There was two of each of the unclean, but there was much more of the clean. And uh, sometimes we miss that as we believe we're so familiar with the story. But God says, I want you to call seven of each of these clean. So they're very well known. 14 of each species of clean. Which Noah will make good use of in an amazing barbecue by the end. So, <laughs> Verse 4. For after seven more days I will cause it to rain on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. And I will destroy from the face of the earth all living things that I have made. And Noah did according to all that the Lord commanded him. So here we have a man who had found grace in the sight of God, had faith in the promises and the word of God enough to, to stand out in his generation and to do something impossible, this building of this ark, in, in a time when it seems that the scriptures may indicate they'd never seen rain before. Um... So, he, here we have this man of faith, and he walks in obedience. In Acts chapter 27, verse 31, Paul's cruising around in a boat as a prisoner, and a big storm comes up. They're about, they think they're going to get shipwrecked, and, and God had told them, hey, look, there's going to be no loss of life. But it was getting bad, and they're about to jump ship and leave all the prisoners stuck on there to die, and, and, and so they're going to jump ship. And Paul says, hey, wait, stop. God has told me there will be no loss of life unless you jump off. See, there's grace in the Lord, and there's 
faith in his word, but we have to, we have to obey. You got to get in the boat. You got to build. You got to, you got to respond to the promise and the grace of God. Verse 6, and Noah was 600 years old when the flood waters were on the earth. So Noah and his, with his sons, his wife, his sons' wives went into the ark because of the waters of the flood. Of clean animals, of animals that are unclean, of birds and everything that creeps on the earth, two by two they went into the ark to Noah, male and female, as God had commanded Noah. So here... You have God calling him, giving him a work to do, and then he somehow enables him to do it. It doesn't make any sense in our, in our world or our time now that animals would just walk up and they would go to Noah, and then he would take care of it from there. Um, that's not our experience with many of the animals and species that kind of be nice around hunting season, but... But they don't tend to do that. But they went up to Noah, and Noah got them all situated. And so you had about seven days from the time to when we would begin to see the beginning of the flood. Verse 10. And it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were on the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, in the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep were broken up. And the windows of heaven were opened, and the rain was on the earth forty days and forty nights. On the very same day, Noah and Noah's sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Noah's wives and the three wives of his sons with them, entered the ark. They and every beast after its kind, all cattle after their kind, and creeping thing that creeps on the earth after its kind, and every bird after its kind, every bird of every sort. And they went into the ark to Noah two by two of all flesh that is that, which is the breath of life. So those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God had commanded him. And the Lord shut him in. So this whole work by faith as he goes in by faith and the Lord begins and brings all of the animals, everything that is going to be preserved that has the breath of life, Brings into the ark, and the Lord shut him in. There's going to be a come a point as the Lord. We are in a days that both Jesus and Peter bring out our indicators, or will be similar to the times coming before the Lord. Noah got to preach for almost a century before the judgment of God would come. As the Lord was patiently waiting and Noah was, I'm sure, enduring some ridicule and, and was a preacher of righteousness, there came a point when it was done and the door shut. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 8-12, through 12, it speaks of such a day that is coming again. That when the man of sin, the Antichrist, is revealed there will come a point when people will no longer be able to believe the truth. God says he's going to give them over to the lie. We know prior to that that the Lord is going to take his church when the times of the Gentiles is complete that we live in now. But there will come a time into the great tribulation when people will be given over to the lie. They will either have refused or taken the mark of the beast and it will be done. The door will be shut. And so Isaiah 55, 6 speaks to us still, and it says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. See, the Lord is so gracious and so patient, so slow to anger. But there is a beginning and an end to everything. There is a time when he will be patient, there is a time when it will be done. And you will either have chose and you will have entered in, or you will have not. Um, most of us will find that door through death. But these guys, and there was a coming generation that will find it if they have not chose the Lord um, through believing a lie and refusing to repent and turn to the Lord. <clears throat> so 
So we're kind of getting into the flood here. And so I'll go ahead and read this next section, read the rest of this chapter before I talk about the water. Verse 17. Now the flood was on the earth 40 days, and the waters increased and lifted up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. And the waters prevailed and greatly increased on the earth, and the ark moved about on the surface of the waters. And the waters prevailed exceedingly on the earth. And all the high hills under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed 15 cubits upward, and the mountains were covered. And all flesh died that moved on the earth. Birds and cattle and beasts and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth and every man. All in whose nostrils was the breath of life, the breath of the spirit of life. All that was on dry land died. So he destroyed all living things which were on the face of the ground, both man and cattle, creeping thing and bird of the air. They were destroyed from the earth. Only Noah and those who were with him in the ark remained alive. And the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days. So as the waters began to rise and rise and continued to rise and maintained up to 150 days. So, how is this possible? Is there evidence? Was it simply something that Moses, ex- or Moses, yeah. that was something you always tried to get your Sunday school kids with, was how many animals did Moses take on the ark? <laughs> so you had to see if they were sleeping or not. <laughs> So Noah here, um, they were in the ark, and it already passed 150 days. So how is this possible? Is it local to Noah's area? Was it global? How is this possible for a number of years? People said it's not possible simply because there's not enough water on the planet Earth. And so a lot of people have taken that perspective, um, believe that if there's no evidence for it, um, then that would be deceptive, and God's not deceptive. So they would kind of, they always look through Scripture through that lens, if you will, um, which generally drives them to a, an old earth point of view, and we talked about that a little bit um, a month or so ago. So we have some of these things as we look at this, and we say, well, if this is allegory, we're all in trouble, then nothing's really literal, and God didn't really make a promise to Abraham, and maybe Jesus didn't really rise from the dead. But if this is literal, we have to take some serious looks at, um, is this true? First of all, as the word of God has been proven true, we know that it is true. Many centuries you didn't have the scientific evidence that we have had to believe it simply because the word of God said it. In our our age of information, we don't settle for that quite quite as easily. So is there enough water? Scientists have recently discovered, and you can check it out, it's kind of interesting, that about 400 miles below the surface of the earth, just, below, just above the lower mantle and just below the upper mantle, there's a, a ring of, for simplicity, you'll have to read it yourself if you want a more complicated answer, basically sweaty rock. And um, it is uh, called ringwoodite. And through a series of tests and observing how shock waves from earthquakes and different seismic activities go through it, they estimate that there's approximately three times the water in that layer than there is in the entire ocean. That there is three times the water under the earth in that, just in that layer, regardless of the underground lakes and stuff, just in that layer than there is in the entire sea. Um, you can look it up, you can check it out. Kind of interesting. So the average depth of the ocean is 12,000 feet deep. So if there's three times that, you would be well above Mount Everest. It would seem that it is within the possibility that if God so chose to, as he says, break up the fountains of the deep to put a little heat down there, or put a little squeeze to it, that water could have flooded the entire earth and that there would be sufficient water for that and sufficient place for it to go. Whether that's what God did, we don't really know, but it is perfectly 
possible. Every major civilization on the planet Earth has a, a story or a record of a flood. The Native Americans, the Pacific Islanders, Europe, Africa, North America, South America, China, Australia, everybody has some story that says the earth was destroyed by a massive cataclysmic flood. Pretty hard to do unless their civilizations experienced it to some degree. Now, legends don't prove everything, but interesting that every major civilization has that. The fossil record, I believe, is a, a major indication that the flood occurred. And so, what do you mean? We have large fossil beds, or you go to the Grand Canyon, you see all the different fossils, or you go to Eastern Oregon, etc. But how does a fossil form? You ever see a deer get hit by the side of the road and then form a fossil? Or whatever, something die in a w the woods and form a fossil? No, because that's not the way it works. It has to be quickly covered and basically moved of oxygen and then eventually have pressure and time. And so when you get to these large fossil beds or these massive fossil records that we have, um, it didn't just simply happen by things croaking because they rot or they get eaten or whatever else. And so it has to occur in a massive event. Whether you want to try to write it, write it off as something else, I believe Scripture clearly gives us a place when it did and how it occurred. The one I want to kind of touch on a little bit more tonight because I don't think a lot of people think about it is, is oil. I think oil really points back to the fact that there was a, a flood. So, again, oil forms very similar to a fossil. It doesn't just occur. It has to have the right conditions of pressure, temperature, and time. And so, on average right now, per day, the world uses about 96 million barrels of oil a day. That's not gallons, that's, that's barrels, somewhere around a 40-gallon barrel. The world, on average, every year, uses about 35 billion barrels of oil a year. So if you look up and you want to Google it or you go into your science book, and say, well, how, how is crude oil formed? Well, you know, there's little plankton in the life and they float down in the bottom of the sea or whatever and they slowly get covered up real quick with sand and eventually go down and form keratin and eventually get squished and makes oil. But again, same problem with the fossils. It doesn't just simply get covered up and form oil. It doesn't just quickly get covered up and removed oxygen in the massive volume that we're talking about. You want to talk about a little bit of oil form that way? Maybe. That's a different story. But when you're using almost the volume of what's behind the Hoover Dam in a year, and then BP turns around and says, hey, we could do that for another 50 years. That is a massive amount of oil that didn't just form from plankton occasionally sinking to the bottom of the ocean or ferns underneath trees. But it would have had to come from a massive event. Woolly mammoths don't just freeze when they're chewing on some food. They're designed for that kind of thing. And so when this water layer dropped from the heavens and the great fountains of the deep broke open, most likely would have also brought forth our, our ice caps as the water probably made it into the troposphere and froze, freezing animals instantly. Antarctica, get underneath the ice and you're going to find living material. Ferns, trees, animals, etc. It used to be something that was not covered by water. So, oil. I just found it kind of cool, cool, just something for you guys to chew on. The U.S. Department of Energies in their Pacific Northwest National Lab developed a continuous process of making useful crude oil. And the process involves basically a pressure cooker, a fancy one. And they'll put 
wet algae under 3,000 pounds of pressure per square inch, heated up to about 600 degrees, and it takes a few minutes and they have a whale. It's not cost effective, so they're not going to do that for Exxon. Um, but it can be done to show the basic principles of how you get oil. Pressure, heat, and time. So like with any mathematical equation, you can, you can move numbers around, but you, it has to always balance out. So like if you go to a high altitude where the atmosphere's pressure is different, you have to cook your food different, right? Right. So I just want to throw out there this, this possibility for you thinkers and science people. So if a lab can produce oil at 3,000 pounds per square inch at 662 degrees in just a few minutes, if you stacked water to just above Everest, you'd arrive at somewhere around 14,000 pounds per square inch three, four, almost five times the amount of pressure that they're using in this lab. And you stacked it under there for, oh, half a year or longer with a little bit of temperature that you would have a slower process of making the same result. There's no other good explanation for the volume of oil that we have. And there's no good explanation for the volume of natural gas that we have and no other good explanation for the volume of coal that we have. Massive, massive deposits. Some of these oil deposits are as big as a city. And there's no good explanation except for a massive cataclysmic event that buried organic material under a massive amount of pressure for over a period of time. Is that the nail in the coffin? No, but it's just some food for thought. The fact is, God said it. There's evidence for it all around the world, whether you find sea life on the top of mountains underneath the glacier caps of the Himalayans, or you find different things like that all around the world. The fact that God spoke it, he judged his world by a flood because they had become evil, and he saved eight people. So there's a lot of good evidence out there, Creation Research Institute, other different ones that have, have some good stuff on that. Dr. Henry Morris, etc., cetera, um, brings a lot of scientific evidence you ever have a chance to check out some of the evidence that came to light through Mount St. Helens on how some of this stuff happens quickly, how they can have fossils and different things that appear very old from a very quick cataclysmic event. There's a lot of good evidence that's come out of the research done since St. Helens blew. Anyways, <clears throat> moving on. Chapter 8, verse 1, Then God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the animals that were with him in the ark, and God made a wind to pass over the earth, and the waters subsided. So here, coming up close to almost a half a year, God remembers Noah. He's out playing golf one day, and his Google calendar buzzes, and oh no, I forgot Noah. Not really. There's a little example um, Travis Hunt uses, and I like it a lot. The word remembered, when we, when we come across it in Scripture, we can plug in a lot of times, basically, the definition to, to call to action. Something that, to, to call to action. Not that God had forgotten Noah, but he came to the forefront of his mind and he, and he responded. A good verse for that would be 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8 says, Paul writing to Timothy and says, Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. And he talks to him about suffering. Remember. Timothy hadn't forgot that Jesus was raised from the dead, but it was supposed to produce a response in his mind, a response in his life, that it was supposed to take this understanding and this knowledge and put it into action. And that's what we see here, not that God forgot, but that he puts into action that he puts Noah at the forefront of his mind, which kind of gives us a little different and interesting flavor into Hebrews chapter 8, verse 12. Hebrews 8, 12. Which says... 
For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. And also Hebrews 10, 17, when it says, then he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Not so much that the eternal all-knowing God forgets, but he will no longer bring into action. He will no longer bring your sin against you. That will no longer be brought up. That will no longer be something that's going to be put against you, against you on your account. Then later, of course, Micah 7, 7, 19, which is always a good one to remember that God has cast him into the sea. So no fishing. You don't get to go there anymore. That relinquishing the right of, of bringing that up again. So God remembered Noah. God put him at the forefront of his mind and took action and began to reduce the waters. Verse 2. The fountains of the deep and the windows of heaven were also stopped, and the rain from heaven was restrained. And the waters receded continually from the earth. At the end of the hundred and fifty days, the waters decreased. Then the ark rested in the seventh month. On the seventh day of the month, on the mount, sorry, seventh day of the month, on the mountains of Ararat. And the waters decreased continually until the tenth month, in the tenth month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains were seen. So it came to pass at the end of forty days that Noah opened the window of the ark, which he had made. Probably a good thing. It probably stunk. Then he said, sent out a raven, which kept going to and fro until the waters dried up from the earth. And also, out from himself, a dove to see if the waters had receded from the face of the ground. But the dove found no resting place for the sole of her foot, and she returned into the ark to him, and the waters were on the face of the whole earth. So she put out his hand, so he put out his hand and took her, and drew her into the ark to himself. And he waited yet another seven days, and again he sent the dove out from the ark. Then the dove came to him in the evening, and behold, a freshly plucked olive leaf was in her mouth, and no one knew that the waters had receded from the earth. So he waited yet another seven days and sent out the dove, which did not return again to him anymore. So here they are, about a, getting closer to a year into it, three quarters of a year. And as they kind of settled on the mountain, I for one probably would have been real tempted to jump out. <laughs> I'll tell you what, I, we, had, uh, we have some new neighbors, and uh, they have a dog. And so they put it in the backyard, and, and he must love them a lot, because he will bark all day. And, uh, you know, I've been that person, so I have a lot of grace for that. But I was just thinking today, as I was studying, I said, man, if I had one of those on the ark, I don't think I could do it. I don't think I could do it. Somebody was going to go. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, month after month, day after day, stinking, squalling animals probably, probably aren't loving your kids too much, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> Their wives are probably thinking, man, my in-laws, this is ridiculous. I'm going to the other end of the ark. <clears throat> bless, bless me with patience, not the opportunities to be patient. I've had plenty of those, and they don't seem to work. <laughs> patience is something you admire in the driver behind you and give a death glare to the one in front of you who practices patience. Now, this is kind of an all-time low, but I'm going to quote him anyways because I like it. Will Farrell once said, before you marry a person, you should uh, first make them use slow internet to see what kind of person they are. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Margaret Thatcher said, I am extraordinarily patient. 
provided I get my way in the end. Yeah. So some patient crew on this boat. It would have been tempting to jump out or to do something other than sit there and wait for the water to slowly recede, recede, wait for the birds to come back. Verse 13, And it came to pass in the six, six hundred and first year, in the first month, the first day of the month, that the waters were dried up from the earth. And Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and indeed the surface of the ground was dry. And in the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth was dried. Then God spoke to Noah, saying, Go out of the ark, and you and your wife, and your sons and your sons' wives with you, bring out with you every living thing of all flesh that is with you, birds and cattle and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, so that they may abound on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So Noah went out, and his sons and his wife and wife and his sons' wives with him. Every animal, every creeping thing, every bird, and whatever creeps on the earth, according to their families, went out of the ark. And so he's got to be just, you know, just got to be screaming freedom. <laughs> uh, of course, after that long time with all of these people, you know, you know what's coming next. One of those animals is going to die. Going to take him out. Verse 20, Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and every clean bird and offered a burnt offering on the altar. So here after this long time with the animals, we have had the first barbecue. So Noah built an altar. Here we also had the first time an altar comes up as he offers a sacrifice of every clean animal. And here it doesn't say, you know, it had been, he'd been giving a lot of instructions from the Lord, but here it just says, then Noah built an altar to the Lord. This guy who had received grace from the Lord and done these things by faith, walked in obedience, now gives this, gives this offering of faith. God loves the offering of faith. It's interesting, as he is our author and finisher of our faith, that in Mark chapter 6, verse 1 through 6, he, Jesus marveled at the Nazarene's unbelief. And then in Matthew chapter 8, verse 5 through 13, he marvels at the centurion's faith. What an amazing opportunity that we have that we can, that we can marvel that we can make Jesus marvel that this opportunity to do things by faith, that whether it was the, the lady who gave two cents in the offering and Jesus said, whoa, now she gave a lot. Or the centurion who had no reason to believe that Jesus could just speak a word and, and heal where he wasn't even at. And Jesus marveled at his faith. I want to turn back to Hebrews, though we've been in there quite a bit tonight. Hebrews 11. 11.1. 11, it's the classic verse on faith, but I think it's worth reading again. Because as we, we look back into the Old Testament, and we see that there really was a man named Noah, and there really was a, a flood and that God really did judge the world, and there people were really people who found grace in his eyes. And he begins to confirm his, his word. And twice the Lord says he wrote these things down that we might have hope and comfort and strength in, the, in his promises. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. And our faith is built upon the sure word of God. It is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. And we can, we can build our faith and we can have our faith in, in what is yet to come because the fact that God has done everything well in the past and has gone exactly as He said it would. Do you guys know that it's more likely 
that a, that a meteor would land on your house multiple times than Jesus to fulfill the prophecies that he did. It's, it's overwhelming. If you do, some, some people have done the math that for Jesus to even fulfill eight prophecies in his lifetime, that one person would do that, is so almost incalculable that it's not possible. And yet he fulfilled over 300 in his life. And still some yet to come. And so as Jesus and Peter reach back to Noah and say, okay, this happened, now we know that the coming of the Lord and eventually the end of the world will come. As they reach back to this time and they use it as something that's going, as to understand the times that are going to happen, know that the sure word of God came to pass in the past so that we might know we have a solid and secure future. We know that over and over again they told about the Messiah and He came and He fulfilled those beyond statistic probability or chance so that we might also have one more thing to know that we are His and that we are saved and that He's coming again. Jesus said, if I go, I'm coming back. You can know and you can test the Word of God. But ultimately it will come down to some measure of faith which the Lord loves. And staying in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, he also writes, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Noah came to the Lord by faith. It seems that what occurred Noah had no reason to believe other than that God said so. He had prophesied through Methuselah. He had prophesied that it was going to come to pass, but he had to make a choice on following the Lord. He had to make a choice on, do I believe what God has said? And of course, we know, obviously, from from tonight that he did. And God said, I am the rewarder of those who believe that I am and that I'm the rewarder of those who diligently seek me. And he does reward, and he rewarded Noah and remembered him. Verse 21, And the Lord smelled a soothing aroma. Then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake. Although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night, will not cease. Even if Al Gore says so. Which, you know, there, there very well may be things in Revelation that do tie to or could be resulted by climate, climate change, regardless of what the cause is. It's possible. I don't get too uptight about whether or not the climate is changing. Obviously, you know, you can go down to Antarctica again and find out that the climate hasn't always been as it is now. It's always under change. Um, but God said, while the earth remains until... He comes until the end of the millennium. The earth will remain in times of seasons and change as it is. We have a promise from Him. There will be a seed time and a harvest. There will be cold and heat, winter and summer, day and night. They will not cease. Even if you use hairspray with CFCs. Because God said so. And so He brings about this rainbow which we find a beautiful picture and we find in wrapped around the throne of God later in the book of Revelation. And God puts it down here as a promise that as I kept my word here, I will also keep my word in the future and I will not do this again. Though we've seen local floods and disasters, he will not once again destroy everything on the earth as he had done. The aroma... I don't think I'll touch that one too much, but I don't think it was a matter of God sticking his face close to the earth and smelling a little of the barbecue, though it would have been tempting. 
there's a few different aromas in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2, Christ's sacrifice was a sweet-smelling aroma. To those who are seeking after life, those who follow the Lord are the aroma of life. And to those who are not, you are the, the aroma or the fragrance of death. So much more than just simply sniffing and, and smelling, but I do love the fact that it comes at when Noah probably would have had to take great joy in offering up those animals and the Lord smelling it and being pleased. So Noah and the ark, Noah's and his deliverance. We'll be moving on next week. Um, I think the only thing I would, I really kind of came out for, for myself and, and, in, and encourage you guys in is that the Lord is the God of the mundane. We've really been hitting that a lot on, on Monday night with the, the high school group. That he is, He's the same God in these amazing things as He is when you got to do some dishes. He's the same God that when you're fishing is when you're on an amazing adventure of faith. And his promises are the same and just as sure in the great things as they are in the small things. He's one who starts things and completes them. So as we look back into a major event in human history that God said would happen and later reminded us that it did happen, it says, that's how sure my word is. And there's a time coming when, when men around us will no longer be able to respond to that. There's a time when he'll close the door and he will come for his bride and say, come up here. And so, as you go about, just be encouraged that God's word is sure. And to walk in that walk of faith, knowing that he is, and he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Those who simply respond and say, you know, here I am, Lord. Use me. As Noah did. As Mary did. As so many have done. And, and the Lord kept them and said, that's an example. Walk in that. Let's pray. Father, you are the one who confirms promises and makes known a, how sure your word is. Lord, in our modern times, you have given us so much science and archaeology continually proving your word. And yet it stood before all of that. Lord, help us to remember your, your sure word. If you say it will, it will. As you say you are coming, you're coming. As you say there will be a one world government, we see that coming to pass. As you say there will be a one world currency, we see that coming to pass. And you said when, when you begin to see many of these things come to pass, look up for your redemption draws near. And so we do, Lord, by faith, knowing that you flooded the earth. And then your son said, those kind of days, that's what you're going to see right before I come. So, Lord, help us to trust in your word and your promises, whether they're the, the ones in our life just to get through the week, or they are the ones that are seemingly impossible. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name.